Hello. Yeah. I can hear you. You have, uh, Dr. Prabhu, you have put me on mute. You have put me on hold right now on the phone. So you wanted to have an image, right? A photograph. Dr. Prabhu, you are on mute. So welcome Dr. Rambu Srivastava. I just saw your message and uh, I have actually made you one of the panelists so you can actually unmute and speak. Dr. Rambu Srivastava. Thank you. Thank you for that. Hi, okay, okay. So welcome, sir. I'm very happy to note that there is interest in HAL Kanpur towards this program because I have worked in HAL Kanpur for three and a half years in the beginning of my career. I know you, sir. Yeah, I yeah. know you. <laughs> Wonderful. So good to have you here. Right, sir. I'll start the recording, sir, as it's five o'clock. Yes, yes, yes. You can start so, the recording. So yes. once you once you start recording, I'll start. All right, so good evening and welcome to everyone. Uh, thanks to Dr. Ramchandra for agreeing to give this uh, <clears throat> third webinar of the fifth NACDEC on the design considerations for amphibian aircraft. I welcome all the team members who are there in this meeting. Uh, we have 28 attendees in the meeting and we also have uh, a few panelists, mostly from the organizing committee and from the design division of the Aero Society of India. So Dr. Ramchand, we'll start uh, by passing on the uh, you know, control to you. You can share your screen. I already shared your screen, so you can start your presentation. All right, okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Pant. Uh, it's my, again, uh, <laughs> pleasure and a privilege to be here. Uh, I'm not really a, a an aircraft designer, but then I, I happen to be a part of the uh, discussions on the webinar uh, on the seaplanes and the amphibians. Anyway, this is the continuation of the last uh, webinar. Where, am, am I audible, uh, all of you? Um, yes, sir. Perfectly clear. Very well. All right. So this is the uh, the uh, the problem statement uh, on an amphibian aircraft for firefighting, it's specific for uh, urban buildings and. Uh, fire, I mean, forest fires. So without much ado, we'll get me get back to the next slide. And this was the one which was presented last time, a typical uh, scenario where um, amphibian aircraft would be used for uh, dosing fires with water or chemicals or chemical retardants. And this is the um, picture that I borrowed from the last webinar. And um, uh, we will, in this webinar, we'll look at uh, the basic concepts which will be brought to your attention, attention to the 36 participant, participants. I don't know how many batches are there in this 36 uh, uh, batch of uh, 36 students, uh, but it doesn't matter really. Uh, it is not, this discussion is not necessarily restricted to amphibian aircraft or any type of amphibian aircraft. And let me uh, tell you at the outset, this presentation is neither a design guide not a solution to the NACDEC problem statement. 
there are intended uh, repetitions of a few parameters, just to stress a few points, so please bear with me. And this is not a structured uh, uh, presentation like in a classroom or the teaching material. I am not going to answer any questions. I'm only going to raise a few uh, doubts, a few uh, phenomena, and then it is for the participants, the students who are competing for this uh, 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 program, project, to seek answers for this. And the material has been sourced from the monograph of NDRF on sea plates. It is available, and I'll tell Prachi how to access that if you people want to do that. And we also drawn some material from open literature and Google Info. Uh, so uh, coming to next uh, slide, uh, we will have a few. This is the schematic of today's uh, about um, 50, 60 minutes of presentation. I'm going to skip a slide, I mean, not skip, and uh, jump from slide to slide uh, without a pass. I will look at a few thoughts on the problem statement, which were uh, discussed last time. And we will also witness a few operational situations. I mean, uh, a few slides on these situations. And we will also um, discuss some unique differences between conventional aircraft and amphibian aircraft, because uh, it is a probable that, it's probable that we will look at uh, aircraft design as a typical conventional aircraft and forget about those things which are unique to amphibians. So I thought I will try to stress upon that. And therefore, uh, factors specific to amphibians, we will uh, this, I mean, I present. And there are a few video clips at the end, uh, just to highlight some of these points and specifically, what are the possible consequences of a bad design with reference to operational requirements of uh, uh, amphibian aircraft. Now, a few thoughts on the webinar, as I said before. Last time we discussed this limits of radius of action and number of passes. If there is a forest fire or an industrial fire far away from uh, this airport or a lake, maybe about 200 kilometers, uh, given the broad specifications and constraints uh, uh, posed on the, the uh, amphibian aircraft, we can't make more than two passes. Um, within that five-hour limitation, five-hour for refueling, uh, re uh, fuel, refueling uh, between, um, I mean, time between uh, two refueling. And so it, two passes is what is possible, and this is what we amended last time. But if the airport or the sea or the lake is within about 15, 15 five, zero kilometers of the urban fire, for example, you can afford to make uh, with the available fuel and the endurance of the aircraft, eight to 10 passes. So this is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the possibility, but we have amended the, um, um, the uh, number of passes to 10 from what was given as 10, uh, because there's an ambiguity it was there. So we want to we made, made it clear, but this is not necessarily should be limited to uh, two passes. Depends on the distance between the air, airport, uh, the, the water body, and the location of the fire. So this is what I wanted to highlight and just reinforce what we discussed last time. And then we have the flotation characteristic as a terminology, but this is nothing but the takeoff distance, uh, either, um, uh, either in the airport on the runway or the water body, uh, the, the takeoff distance on the water body. And this is what I exactly meant by, well, you don't have to have any other interpretation of that. And um, we discussed uh, the, uh, actually the, the do's and don'ts and the problem statement. These were discussed elaborately in the last webinar and few amendments have been, very few amendments in fact have been uploaded. And this is just a recap of what we discussed. And here it is. Now the important thing as far as an amphibian aircraft is concerned is its ability to scoop water while it's moving on the surface of the water within about 15 seconds. And you should be able to draw at least five tons of water. And the distance is not more than one kilometer. So you need to seek, uh, locate um, ponds or lakes or tanks or whatever, or even see where there's a clear uh, kilometer distance, linear distance for it to do. So maybe in a very uh, wooded area, for example, what we've shown here, uh, the, the aircraft should be able to maneuver to be, and be able to land on water and run for about a kilometer and scoop of water and lift off to a flight altitude. So this is something which is uh, important for you to note. And this was again mentioned last time, and I want to repeat this again. Uh, it is typically, uh, it, as amphibians, uh, aircraft, uh, amphibian aircraft 
are not normally parked in airports unless there's a, become a necessity and it's a possibility. But typically, if it is parked in a sea in a water body, either a lake or a seashore, uh, for a firefighting uh, uh, authority, you don't have to go back to the airport. You know, in fact, it can take off from the lake itself and go over to the fire zone and uh, and douse the fire, try to douse the fire. And in the process, it can make as many passes as possible directly between the lake water body and the firefighting. On the other hand, for some reason, if the seashore, I mean, if the amphibian is parked in the airport, it perforce has to go to the water body, pick up water, and then go and uh, uh, go to the fire zone for, uh, for firefighting. Uh, if for some reason, if a chemical retardant is required, it obviously cannot uh, use the lake. So it has to fly away from the airport and go to the fire zone. And therefore, the, it all depends on, as I said before, the typical distances between the airport, the water body, and the target fire zone. So this is uh, something which uh, I think we need to highlight once again. So just to give some examples, uh, not to have any confusion, I've taken some uh, names here in, in, in Bangalore. Uh, if it is um, a high-rise building fire, for example, uh, it can, uh, the, if the amphibian is in the airport, it has to run and take off and then go to the nearest uh, water body, which could be, which is in fact within about 50 kilometers. It's called a Bellando Lake. It uh, just gets into the gets on the surface, picks up water, and goes to the high-rise building. And typically, high-rise buildings are expected to be within the urban scenario, maybe about 50 kilometers. So, with this, it can make many, many sorties, not necessarily restricted to two numbers. And it's also necessary that it has to do multiple passes. And therefore, the capability or the capacity or the sort of the, the, the uh, functionality of the uh, amphibian should be able to do a uh, complete dumping or partial dumping as the case may be. So this is one scenario. The next scenario is a uh, forest fire. The forest may be away, 200 kilometers away from a place uh, uh, like Bangalore Airport, for example. Then if it is going to fly out of Bangalore, it has to, it is uh, rather unprofessional to go back and forth between the Bangalore International Airport and the forest fire. So the first flight will be from International Airport, Bangalore Airport, and then it goes and seeks the nearest water body and lands there. And from there, it picks up water and does this uh, looping uh, any number of times as required. And therefore, you have to locate a, a place which is very close to the forest fire, a, a water body, and then keep the distance minimum and make as many uh, uh, sorties as possible. So this is possibly the, the, the strategy that any firefighting system will adapt and not uh, just go from one 200 kilometers away for one sortie and then uh, if the forest fire is not put out, be stranded. So some, something has to be uh, sort of planned with that. If, if it is an urban scenario, as I was mentioning earlier, it could be either from the airport or from a local water body and this could be uh, either water or fire retardant. I'll skip this. This is what I also said. But these are the tasks expected to be carried out. This was uh, very uh, clearly mentioned last time. And I don't want to repeat uh, doing this again. And similarly, what not to do was also very clearly mentioned in the last webinar. And there is no doubt necessity for repeating this. But what, I, in my opinion, what cannot be avoided is, are these things for obvious and essential reasons? We need to be doing, in spite of the problem statement not being clear. I think this is something which I wanted to highlight in this webinar. And it is therefore a necessity to have a capability to operate as a typical amphibian aircraft uh, for firefighting, which means the aircraft should be able to do uh, water scooping the way it has been specified, retard and loading at the airport jettisoning system to jettison water the way it is required. It could be one, one go, it could be a partial uh, um, uh, jettisoning or full jettisoning, uh, whatever. And of course, the landing air. Landing air, because it's an amphibian, it has to take, from, take off from the airport and land on water and repeat this. You need to be looking at landing air, which is an important uh, part of the amphibian aircraft. And there are unique control features. When I talk about control features, I'm not talking about the control features of the aircraft alone. We're talking about uh, scooping 
uh, so, you know, so controlling the scoping mechanisms, uh, uh, detectioning mechanisms, and other other things associated with that. So these are some of the things which I think we should not escape. I mean, you should not uh, forget. It should be a part of your conceptualization. So as a, as a set of functional requirements for the amphibians, we have uh, uh, both sea and land operation. It should be able to operate uh, not only on lake surface, which are typically calm surfaces, but also on sea, which could be any, any uh, level of sea, state of sea. It could be low, it could be medium or very really rough, but we are uh, assuming that it will be able to operate on medium sea state uh, from the seashore. And it should be able to do uh, handle both uh, fire retardant and water. And as I mentioned earlier, and I'm going to repeat this again, five tons of water within 15 seconds with a takeoff distance of about a meet I mean, a kilometer on water and one and a half um, kilometers of uh, uh, run, runway length in the airport. It should be able to uh, offtake uh, four and a half tons of fire retardants within four minutes. And therefore, the, the system that you conceptualize should be able to handle all these uh, requirements. And as I repeated earlier, uh, it should be, be a single pass or it could be in smaller vol volumes, multiple pass over the fire zone. Uh, what is specified in the uh, problem statement is a uh, uh, maximum flight speed over 250 kilometers with full payload. And what can be uh, a, an alternative to that is 500 kilometers per hour after uh, dropping without a payload, therefore, All right? So then, of course, this has been stated earlier, three kilometers is the altitude of firefighting service, and it could be something above 45 degrees centigrade. Uh, and of course, we are not uh, discussed seriously the wind speeds, the crosswinds. So we need to establish uh, the crosswind capability of an amphibian aircraft. We know what are the possibilities for typical transport aircraft, but this has to be uh, looked at seriously. Now, we also should describe the flight envelope of these amphibian uh, aircraft, uh, which, 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 which with the payloads, which could be different payloads itself. All right. So, uh, as, a, as I mean, it's, uh, it's obvious, it is uh, simply um, implied uh, requirements. It should be able to handle thick smoke over the uh, fire area and other things which are highlighted in red are what I repeated earlier. And the fuel capacity uh, required for the aircraft, which, which also has the um, specifications of the, air, um, the engines, uh, should have at least five hours per day uh, between refueling cycles, either at the airport or at the seaport. When I say seaport, it could be sea or it could be a water body, uh, like a lake or something like that. And this uh, actually, I repeated, I uh, skipped this. Uh, well, uh, what is important is there are special mechanical systems for firefighting operations as part of the amphibian uh, aircraft. And this, is in, this includes kinematic, mechanical, hydraulic, and electronic devices to scoop water uh, while the uh, amphibian is on the surface of the water of the lake or a sea. And of, now it's uh, obvious to uh, say uh, the tanks holding should be leak proof with proper sealing arrangements, and tank should be designed to open his jettison doors uh, for uh, partial or full uh, cargo, full payload. All right, so the designing of the land gear is something which is important and I don't think I need to uh, impress upon you guys the importance of um, the landing gear. Landing gear, we are talking about a payload of five, kilo, five uh, tons and there is a commensurate typically a, a, a number of uh, times this payload, the total weight of the aircraft. And they should uh, fly uh, and take off and land on the airport with uh, the commensurate associated landing loads. And uh, that depends on the landing speeds that this, is, this system is capable of. And it should always splash down on water and be able to move. So there, there are these issues of landing gears um, uh, of the aircraft. And of course, the propulsion system, there are many, many versions of the uh, typical amphibian aircraft today have uh, all sorts of uh, propulsion system. It could be a turboprop, it could be a turbojet, and it could be also old version of IC engines, but to typically IC engines are for smaller aircraft. And then the engines could be a tractor or pusher type, 
it could be mounted above the wings, above the fuselage. So the, the whole configuration is something which is important for you to discuss and you should be able to make out um, the configuration and the justification for that. Uh, quickly, the unique features of amphibian aircraft, uh, there are basically today two types of them, uh, the float plane and the, the one that you see at the, uh, at the right side, the, um, the uh, flying boat. And I, I know I'm sure at this point in time in the, I mean, this point in, in the project, you have scanned all the entire literature and you're aware of this. I don't want to go into the details. Uh, basically, you're talking about um, uh, float plane where uh, an already existing aircraft is modified to be located, to be integrated with the floats. And this float, design of the float is the most interesting thing that you guys uh, will be uh, going through. Um, because they are very sophisticated. They look very simple, but they're very, very uh, intricate um, uh, devices which, which support the aircraft on, uh, on, on the top. So this is the float plane. And then, of course, as I mentioned, the float has got a wonderful, uh, very critical uh, geometry, materials, and functionalities. And you can see at the top, uh, uh, top left, you have the aircraft, which is a very simple um, aircraft. It's maybe a three-seater, four-seater aircraft. But then uh, our um, firefighting thing won't be as simple as that. But uh, just to come, uh, just to um, uh, sort of demonstrate the requirements of a typical float. And the philosophy is, if the if the length of the fuselage is this L, uh, the float is uh, offset. It is moving to the front, and it's about 70 percent of the length of the fuselage. So this is something which is very unique. It is a, uh, a practice, but this may not be your concept. But you must therefore see, study all the possibilities. But what is important and unique uh, to the floats, uh, uh, not only for the float plane, but even for the flying boat, is the 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 part, the the feature called the step. Yeah, or what I'm showing here, and this is something which uh, reduces the reduces the drag, hydraulic drag, at the time of uh, takeoff. And there are several other parts which I thought I will um, discuss in, in detail. You will probably spend a little more time in understanding these things. But what's interesting in the floor plan is the retractable water rudder at the back. And this is something which you must really look and study in detail and see what type of, um, it has got uh, a, a kinematic uh, linkage and it's connected to the aircraft controls. And of course, the shape and the size of the, uh, of the uh, water rudder itself is unique to the design of the aircraft. It depends on the configuration, it depends on the size and shape and so on. What is common to both though is the landing loads, it's a minimum drag, you should have longitudinal and lateral stabilities, and you must see the relative location of these floats uh, with reference to the aircraft. All right, and coming the, back to the next one, this is the flying boat. It is uh, an aircraft sitting on a typical boat. I mean, it is not as simple as that, uh, but uh, if you look at the configuration, it looks like a boat on which an aircraft is built. And most of the times, float planes are uh, built around an existing aircraft, whereas flying boats are actually built with the, from the base, from the boat configuration to the uh, fuselage of the aircraft. And you can see in the, in the example which I've given here, we have uh, two uh, turbo props and uh, very close to the fuselage. And this is something which you must just uh, aer aer aeronautical engineers should ponder over and see which is the aircraft, what is the location of that with reference to the wing. And then you see, a, though it's a flying boat, you have two floats in addition. So this uh, flying boat has not only a hull of a boat, it also has two floats. Whereas the flying float plane uh, has only two floats. There is something uh, very different. So this is something which you, you must uh, look at. And looking at the hull itself is a very unique, very unique, uh, very, uh, um, unique com uh, geometrical configuration. What I've shown here, you can see uh, the V bottom of the, the boat structure, the boat hull of the flying boat is very, very interesting. And you have a spray tip at the edges to prevent water being splashed around. And you can also see similar thing at the bottom of the tip float. Tip float is not simple floating bodies. They are also hydrodynamic surfaces. And you can see, I've given you the bottom here, 
uh, several possible configurations for the bottom uh, uh, configuration of the hull itself. A very theoretical flat, which is never used normally, but you have very complex um, uh, shapes for the bottom of hull of the, of the aircraft. So which is the best or most optimal hydrosurface uh, for the, uh, the amphibian aircraft that you're going to design is something which you must uh, really put some effort and time on in arriving at that. A typical cross-section of a, not a firefighting amphibian aircraft, but a passenger aircraft. This is a very simple thing. I just illustrated to uh, tell you that there are issues which do with realize, uh, in relation to the uh, hull, or the, the basic fuselage of the amphibian aircraft. Uh, this, this distance is called a beam. And then we have floats. Um, there is a relation between the volume of the, of the hull and uh, hull of, of the volume of the tip floors. So there is the, the, those uh, the issues which you must study in a conceptualization exercise. And also you can see that there are a few critical angles, uh, the, the, the angle between this tip and that um, position and the angle of what they call a dead rise and the angle dead rise angle is something which is very, very important. I mentioned about the step. The step is the unique feature of any amphibian, any seaplane, uh, uh, which are used for several applications. We'll come to the applications a little later. You can see the step, and then there is a flat surface here, and then there is a taper uh, at the back of the step. And these are all very unique to each, uh, each aircraft design. And I think when you do conceptualization, it's not just the power or thrust or whatever, it should you go, should go into these details without um, which it will be not a doable uh, configuration. So this is what I wanted you to uh, look at. And there are several other important uh, things. You can see the importance of the CG location with reference to the step. And there are several features. I will leave this uh, uh, slice with you anyway. You are going to, or you might have even seen this before. So you must look at these configurations very critically uh, to look at the this hydrodynamic part of the uh, amphibian aircraft. All right. Now, typical applications. There are many. Uh, quite a few of them are there. But what I uh, wanted to highlight here is the urban firefighting and forest fires, which we are now addressing as a functionality of the seaplane. We are also having these things for many other applications. For example, study of oil slicks in ocean, uh, uh, handling oil slick itself is possible. Health monitoring of offshore equipment, coastal secondary transportation, disaster management, and so on. Here's a typical example of what the seaplanes can do uh, with reference to oil wells uh, in deep sea uh, oil wells, not deep sea, uh, offshore oil wells. And they can look at the structure uh, by going very close to that possibility. We can fly into that place. Typically, helicopters are used for oil wells, but here is an additional possibility of uh, oil wells being, I mean, being examined, inspected by these seaplanes. Uh, land encroachment and uh, oil slick and disaster uh, in the coastal areas can be handled. And importantly, we have the rescue operations uh, possible with, um, with this uh, amphibian aircraft. And today we are talking about uh, transport, uh, people transport, uh, personal transport, but we are also using it in a very, very big way. In fact, the Indian Navy is using this for uh, na uh, naval material transportation. But we are not today not worried about all those things. We are talking about uh, fire uh, handling, fire um, in urban scenario or in forest uh, locations. These are the three uh, things we have described in this uh, project propo and, uh, pro problem proposal problem statement. We also have two types of amphibian uh, aircraft. So which one do you choose? What configuration you choose? And th this is the crux of the whole pro project. Now, as far as um, uh, firefighting amphibians are concerned, typically uh, what you see here it is. You can see very conspicuous the so-called step, the straight portion here, and the uh, and inclined the portion there. And the position of the wing, the position of the aircraft and the tail surfaces, and they're all part of the whole conceptualization uh, work that you're going to take. It could be even a, an existing aircraft being modified to uh, a transport aircraft being modified to act as an amphibian aircraft. 
and you can see some typical examples of uh, firefighting in forest area and urban scenario, which you must, I'm sure you have seen. But I, what I wanted to highlight from these two bottom uh, figures is, the firefighting is a skill, is the capability of the machine, but also a capability of the skill of the pilot. You need to, it's like uh, 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 drop, dropping uh, 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 an armament uh, while you are speeding up at certain location and uh, at certain speed. And therefore you need to be assessing when and how much of this um, retardant or water should be opened uh, at a given speed, keeping the target in mind and relating it to the thing. It is, of course, uh, something which you must describe in your uh, possibility uh, capabilities, but this is something which is uh, a combination of pilot uh, and the machine. Uh, typical endurance features of this, uh, you can see, if you look at the survey, this is a pretty old survey, a 10 year old survey, and typical uh, seaplanes are actually having um, uh, about 20 passengers as a common thing, though uh, 40, 50, 60 people can be transported in bigger and seaplanes. Uh, this is the type of uh, equipment that we are talking about. It's not a small uh, aircraft. We are talking about lifting five tons of water, and therefore it will be a big size in terms of uh, the, the volume and the weight and physical dimensions. So this is the type of uh, equipment we're talking about. And if you look at the today's uh, capability, uh, the endurance capability, of a small and medium haul uh, seaplanes. They run up to three hours continuously. This is the type of endurance we have. And looking at our five hour uh, period for um, refueling and the type of um, exercise that we're gonna do from the airport to the fire zone to runs, you must be having something this or better than this in terms of uh, endurance. So this is something which you must keep in mind in looking at the aircraft engine selection. Uh, we talked about uh, operational sequence. Uh, we take off from airport if required and land on water. And then from water, you must start uh, moving. Uh, you, start, uh, you, you start from the idling position to uh, scoop run, and then you take off at the end of the uh, length that is required for scooping of one and a half, uh, I mean, five tons of water. And then uh, after finishing this, uh, come and land, land on water. And this landing also should be done within the existing water surface um, linear length, uh, maybe a kilometer. So this is the sequence. And if you really look at, uh, this is available in the monograph and many, many uh, 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 any journals on um, amphibians or seaplanes. It has got uh, in idling position, the center buoyancy of the aircraft, I'm, I'm discussing with reference to your flow plane. You can see that it is uh, the float is here, and then the set of points here, and it is simply in the idling position uh, in taxing. And then uh, you can see at this position, the water rudder is down below the water. And when you want to start running for a scoop run, uh, you go to what is called uh, in the in the in the, the, the seaplane terminology is flowing position, where the water rudder is below and the attitude of the aircraft is slightly up, and it is it is uh, running uh, on the front of the aircraft is above the water, and but as you speed up, you you go to the planning position where the water rudders are up above the water. And the center buoyancy is towards the front of the aircraft, and you're really working on the taxing on the step. So these are the three initial steps uh, through which the equipment moves forward before it starts taking off. So therefore, you have uh, the displacement phase, the hump, or the blowing phase, and the planning, and the on the step phase, and then the lift off. You can see there's a summary of the power that is required, the thrust that's required from the engine. And you can see when the engine or the aircraft or the amphibians tries to move a little uh, from the from this idling position, the power is quite low. Uh, that is, resistance is quite low, and the power you have good reserve. And when it starts going through a blowing phase, the resistance, hydraulic resistance, are very very high, and uh, still the power is enough to give it for, for speed. And when you are at the third, that is uh, on the step, sorry, on the on the step phase. Uh, there is a reduction in the hydraulic resistance. And when you're really about to take off or lift off, your uh, 
hydraulic resistance come down quite a bit and you have a good reserve for speeding up the aircraft and overcome the drag and you're airborne. So this is something which you must uh, look at with reference to the design of the engine, uh, picking up, uh, now when I say design, selection of the engine, and what is the hydraulic for, what are the hydraulic forces or the resistance that are uh, coming on the aircraft you're selected and be able to make a good um, so, so justification for the type of uh, configuration and the type of uh, engine that you select for this. And uh, there is the difference between uh, the conventional aircraft and uh, the um, uh, amphibian aircraft with reference to the aerodynamics uh, involved. Uh, you, you're all aeronautical engineers. Um, I'm sure I don't need to spend any time at all on this, but the, if you take a trainer or a transporter, all the parameters, all the parts of an aircraft have their functionalities and you know them very, very well. These are all uh, designed and configured to handle the aerodynamic problems of the aircraft, conventional aircraft, transport or military or whatever. Um, but this is different. Uh, and therefore, if you study the aircraft with reference to the wing, flow over the wing, uh, to determine the lift, the drag, the, the, the weight and the, the thrust that is required for an aircraft to be airborne and be able to move at particular speed in certain directions, you have solved um, quite a bit of the problem. And if you have the aircraft, uh, the whole um, flow around the aircraft, you have you made it easier. And you're also interested in what happens to the wake of the aircraft. And it's very important when you're flying uh, in swarms, uh, in, in an airport, for example, the wake can affect the, uh, the following aircraft. So all these things are aerodynamic features of a typical aircraft design, but it is different when it comes to uh, uh, amphibians. When I say amphibian, there are two types of amphibians. There's another amphibian, which is a hovercraft. Hovercraft, which is a water and land vehicle, is not airborne, but it's still an hover amphibian uh, because it can be on water and it can be on ground, which are being used uh, in several uh, for several applications. It could be for transport, it could be military. There here, it, actually, the, the system works, uh, this hovercraft works, on uh, levitation, there is a, a compressed air uh, through the a compressor on, the, on board, which uh, pushes air on at the bottom of the uh, vehicle. There is a skirt all around, and it, this uh, air, which is moving out, it lifts the it gives the levitation and lifts the um, uh, the vehicle up, and it prevents the uh, uh, contact with either water or from with the ground. So it is actually levitation, and the forward force is uh, given by the, the, the fans or the propellers, which are shown here. And these two uh, give you also the controls. So there is no serious aerodynamics in this vehicle, though there is a bit of aerodynamics involved. It is very low speed, therefore aerodynamics and may not a major concern. And there is no serious hydrodynamics also, because uh, there is no uh, contact of the vehicle with the uh, water surface is based on uh, levitation, there is no contact with water. So there is no hydrodynamics and there is no aerodynamics. It's basically levitation and movement of the vehicle. So this is an, another amphibian, uh, the groundwater and free, uh, land water amphibian. This is different from the, the combined hydrodynamics and aerodynamics of an amphibian aircraft. Here is the situation. Now, when the amphibian, uh, that is the, the firefighting aircraft, uh, the amphibian aircraft is on water, which is, when it is stationary, it is a balance between the weight and the buoyancy. There is no hydrodynamics involved. There's no aerodynamics at all. It's weight and ba the balance between weight and buoyancy. Whereas when it's trying to move out and take off or landing, you have both aerodynamics and hydrodynamics coming into picture. You have the weight, you have propulsive force, the buoyancy of the water, the hydro, hydrodynamic and associated levitation. Aerodynamic lift is also parallel acting. There's a drag, there's a flight and glide speed and stability. All these issues are there when it is trying to run on the surface of water and take off. And once it's airborne, totally airborne, then you have only aerodynamic forces. Because, and weight, the propulsive force, aerodynamic lift, drag, flight speed and stability are the issues involved. So there is the three different levels of uh, activities or uh, processes that are, are working on the same uh, amphibian aircraft. 
when it's on stationary water, when it's moving on water, when it's completely airborne and moving on water. So this is a situation. When it's stationary in water, you have the vehicle floating. And when, it, when it's floating, you know, you know, it's a very fundamental thing. You all know the uh, re relation between the gravity uh, and of course the buoyancy and how much of displacement takes place when the boat or the uh, amphibian is on water. And if it is uh, not balanced, you, it won't float, it will sink or uh, completely uh, go to the bottom. So you, you need to have a balance between the balance forces and the weight of the system or the density of the system. But then uh, important thing, why I mentioned this here is very fundamental, it's very stupid to uh, bring it to engineering students, but why I brought this here is this amphibian aircraft is supposed to be designed for operation both in a lake or in a seawater in sea. Uh, there is a big difference, but not a big difference, there is a difference between uh, seawater and river uh, or lake water, which is a, a freshwater lake, for example, the densities are different. And how different are they and what its impact on the design of the aircraft uh, is something what you guys do. Uh, take this hint and size the plane for operation both in water, lake water, or some um, uh, pond water uh, with the low density and sea with got a high density. So something which is there. Now we are talking about, for example, aircraft which is subsonic, which is supersonic, which is hypersonic. We got the incoming mark, uh, flow, airflow, mark numbers and shock waves and its effect on the drag and lift capabilities. A lot of things you have learned. It's not very different even in, it may not be supersonic or even subsonic for that matter, but when the, when the amphibian moves on water, you see the front part, which is the bow and the stern, it creates what uh, waves, uh, bow divergent waves, which are shown there. And also the trailing edge, which is the stern, it also creates waves. And there is a certain amount of clash, I mean, the interaction between the bow wa waves and the stern waves. And it affects the hydrodynamics and the hydrodynamic resistance. I don't have any numbers to give you any formula or equation or anything to give, but this is something which you must really look at to look at, evaluate the hydraulic hydrodynamic forces or resistance, which will act on this vehicle when it moves uh, from a stationary position to a takeoff roll position. So this is something which I thought I should mention this to you. Whether you want to incorporate all these things in, the, in, the, in your conceptual design or not is another issue, but this is something which you as a person dealing with hydro, um, these uh, amphibian aircraft should know. So here is something which is uh, which was already uh, uh, shown earlier. The thrust of the engine is always much higher than the total resistance uh, of the vehicle as it starts from stationary position uh, to a roll of uh, uh, takeoff position. There's the water speed. And there is the internal uh, resistance of the uh, hydraulic resistance, I mean, so hydro resistance, if you like, and the dynamic resistance, which is both combined hydrodynamic and aer aerodynamic forces coming on the vehicle. And the total is something like this, which is shown here. And this is um, lower uh, than the thrust available on the engine. This is something which is fundamental. So you've got to look at the sizing of the engine a selection of the engine with reference to what sort of hydraulic uh, total resistance that needs to work. It's very similar to our drag, all right? And uh, so uh, on, the, on the conventional aircraft. So this is something which you must uh, look at. Now, there are uh, always problems of takeoff and landing in a, in a conventional aircraft, which is no different. In fact, it's much more severe in the case of, um, in the case of uh, hydro, I mean, amphibian aircraft. And as I said, there are several features of the landing and floats or the hull of the aircraft, which try to minimize these landing and takeoff uh, issues. And there are some definitions and I just uh, put a few of them here, but I think you need to study that in detail. And if you look at uh, the nomenclature that is given of the geometrical features, the keel, the keel is the one here, this flat portion, and that's the one. And this is, uh, give, right, is given there to, uh, resist sideways motion to give lateral stability, to, to add some lateral stability to the, the, the floats so that you don't really uh, move uh, uh, sideways unnecessarily. What is most important in all of them, of all of them is the step. Step, which is shown there, 
uh, its location and its uh, the size, etc., all so much dependent on the, the the float design. And I think you must put some effort on this issue. It reduces the hydrodynamic drag and causes the flow to break away from the hull. This is something which is important. You, you, you must definitely see some of these video clips which show a wonderful uh, picture of how the step helps in all these things. There's so many small features without which uh, the complete design of the float. And um, when I say complete design, I'm not talking about detailed design. I'm not talking about stress analysis or uh, I'm not talking about, um, shall we say, uh, geometrical uh, tolerances and things like that. The specific features of a float or a, um, the bottom of a flying boat has to have all the surfaces in a typical conceptual. And if you design a, 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 a aircraft without, a, for example, the keel, you have a very serious situation. So I am just trying to understand, uh, uh, sort of identify the importance of some of these very, very special features of um, the amphibian aircraft. And as far as operational issues are concerned, you must know this. There are several uh, operational uh, difficulties that the seaplanes normally pay, uh, face. Uh, two of them are uh, purposing, purposing and skipping. These are the two uh, possible uh, things which you must fundamentally avoid uh, for a good operational efficiency without any serious uh, catastrophic problems for the system. Uh, the, the seaplane, when it is taken off or when it's, uh, when it's landing, it's supposed to land on a straight on the surface of water. But if it is not designed properly, or if probably the pilot makes a mistake, you can have a movement called the purposing, which is uh, going up, falling down, going up, and uh, probably ultimately it may even sink just get into water. So this is purposing. It's something like a dolphin. You know, sometimes the dolphins have this purposing movements and so they're happy, enjoying, but this is not a very enjoyable situation for the seaplane. All right, so there's another thing called skipping, uh, where the, 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 uh, the speed, uh, speed of uh, landing is not properly uh, sort of configured. These features of the landing surface not well featured. And the, the system will go up and go up and because of the speed is not uh, commensurate with the um, surface of the water and the, and the uh, angular, the, the angles or the uh, parameters selected for landing are not okay. And this, this has to happen in water. And you also uh, should take care of the landing uh, conditions of, of the water. If there is so, there are waves that are uh, this could affect the landing pattern. The purposing and skipping will be dependent on this water condition, so that needs to be defined. And then, of course, there are uh, issues um, uh, surfaces if um, uh, not properly designed. You will have a problem of landing in uh, water with uh, crosswinds. What is the tolerance of the vehicle to crosswinds? Is something which is really important to understand and put into your configuration. And there, there are certain protocols which the pilots are given, uh, how to handle the aircraft and land safely with uh, crosswinds uh, well-defined. And with the sea, sea, sea water, the, the, the wave, wave surfaces, wavy surfaces being uh, uh, defined, there is a protocol. But what is important is uh, the landing width of the amphibian aircraft with crosswinds is uh, really tricky. Uh, because it is uh, very uh, typically is not as stable as uh, land. I mean, conventional aircraft. I mean, here is an example. If there's a crosswind in that direction, in the, uh, right to left, and if you land the vehicle in a circular path, which is uh, shown here, you're going to have centrifugal forces, which also add to the lateral forces, and you will very quickly uh, reach the un unstable zone, and you will roll over. So that's something which you must avoid. Whereas the pilot should be cool enough to send the wind direction and land this in, in a curve, which is uh, say clockwise curve. And then what happens, the wind direction are opposed by the centrifugal forces and you have a lot of stability incorporated in the wind in, in the vehicle and your you landing safety is much more. And therefore it is uh, the design 
It is the pilot action, which will make sure that uh, the crosswinds are affected. It's very similar to what we uh, normally see of big aircraft, or, say twin engine or four engine aircraft uh, landing in a runway when, when there is a very huge crosswind. You can see this, um, you must have seen all these things. The, 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 the pilot uh, touches the runway with a, at an angle, which is opposing the direction of the wind. And once it touches the ground and is moving on the runway, he corrects the direction uh, so that it runs along the runway. This is a typical crosswind uh, landing uh, protocols which the pilots are following. And this is not very different for seaplanes as well. This is what I wanted to tell. There are three uh, phases of liftoff. Uh, and then there are a few issues which needs to be handled for handling crosswind landing on water. Uh, this is applicable for both float planes as well as uh, flying boats. So on top of it, we are having a very special requirement of having to have uh, five tons of uh, payload and it is packed with the five tons. And we also we have to have five hours of um, uh, fuel for five hours of uh, uh, endurance. So you want to have two uh, big fuel capacity and uh, water tank filled with water or uh, chemical retardant. And when you take off, uh, is, I mean, we are not talking about taking off at uh, 150 meters per second, like a typical uh, um, land and conventional aircraft, but still for the type of uh, takeoff speeds that we have, you can have sloshing of the fuel uh, and the water. And when you're doing a firefighting maneuver, uh, you have a serious problem because then you must be uh, having uh, quite a bit of undefined um, maneuvers required. Pilots should be trained, but the vehicle should be capable of doing it. And at that time, sloshing might become a bit of a problem to handle. So uh, uh, what is the sloshing effect? How to reduce the sloshing in the tanks, with, both for water and the fuel, is an important feature for uh, these uh, Humphrey bin aircraft. All right, so this is uh, something which is, um, uh, which is, which is, uh, shall we say, uh, typically difficult parts of the thing, and we have uh, uh, the the um, main task of selecting the power plant for the aircraft. The power plants could be uh, typical IC engines, which is not normally used for big aircraft, but basically it could be a turboprop and uh, turbo jet or turbo fans. So here are some examples where the uh, small passenger uh, amphibian aircraft with the uh, turboprops on either side. The location of the uh, of the, uh, the size, the, the, the power, and the location of the aircraft. Is it a pusher type or a tractor type? Is it on the wing mounted? In this case, it's not wing mounted, for example, there. And here you can see the four planes on a single engine. And we have uh, six engines I mean, here on the big, huge monster of amphibian aircraft for, for transportation. And therefore, uh, there is a plethora of possibilities. You can even have uh, turbo jets and turbo fans for this uh, theater. So what is the justification? What is the uh, confidence levels that we have in having this? What about the water ingestion in this? Um, uh, and because you're going to work very close to the sea surface. And so what happens uh, to the engines? Uh, they should work in saline atmosphere. So the selection process for most of the subsystems uh, is to be very debated very carefully with reference to what is available, what's being practiced, and what is your take on the selection process. So here are some of the issues that I thought I'll, I'll just brush through, rush through, and I have done that. But I have um, a few clips of um, uh, uh, videos which I picked up and uh, sort of uh, made it a small segments to highlight uh, the points that I have made earlier. Now here is a flown a float plane working very beautifully in Maldive in Male Ma uh, Island, and here is the uh, clip of that. You can see it's a float plane, very uh, gently, very um, uh, um, smoothly taking off uh, from water, and um, and it's going to land uh, uh, equally efficiently, equally. Uh, um, smoothly and you can see it's a, uh, it's a, it's a passenger plane so uh, atmosphere, I mean, care has to be given to handling this particular um, takeoff landing uh, issues. Now then, um, well, almost all archipelagos, Indonesia, Malays, or Greek, or Canada, they all have this uh, passenger craft so nicely taking off and landing. 
It's a beauty to uh, see, see them. Um, and here is a, a, a clip on a small, a very small uh, amphibian aircraft. Uh, not for firefighting, it's a three seater, four seater, and you can see how graceful it is uh, taking off from water and then lifting off and taking a bank and then going away from this water surface. And you can see the small size of the water surface very close to the urban area. And you, see, you can see how nicely it is landing. And it's, it's a beauty to watch that. So this is as far as a very small amphibian is concerned. And then of course we have um, um, a very amazing uh, feat of landing, taking off and landing within about 50 meters. You can see this is a small uh, float plane. It is I think two seater and it is demonstrating it can take off within 50 meters. It's a little sluggish and of course it's struggling, but it takes off 50 meters and that it lands again in a very small stretch of water within 50 meters. You can see it's very carefully landing, but landing is not a good splashdown, but it lands all right. This is not more than 30 meters. So it's a short takeoff landing float plane and that is something which I wanted to tell. And if your design is not good, if the pilot is not good, uh, all your firefighting uh, systems can go awry. So some of those things are uh, explained this. Here is a, a float plane. This is actually a development float plane. It is an RC plane. You can see it is purposing because it's a, it's a ability to handle uh, the uh, uh, landing uh, takeoff angles, et cetera, not different. So it just goes and simply crashes. So it's a question of uh, purposing, and that is to be uh, avoided in your design if possible, and I'm sure it is possible. And here is uh, a, 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 uh, an example of a float plane, RC plane. Uh, it takes off very well. It is a float plane, and you can see this is a good example of purpose. One, two, three. It just lands, and you start at a, a right type of landing. This cannot happen. It can happen in an RC plane, which is a small toy being developed, but this cannot happen on our RC, I mean, plane for firefighting, which is a huge monster. And for that, I think it needs to be avoided. And uh, here is a case of um, evidence of uh, 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 the, the centrifugal forces not balancing. You can see it landed uh, unequally, uh, uh, asymmetrically, and the centrifugal force at the point of landing was too bad, and then you had a crash, and that is something which is unfortunate. You, you need to be handling uh, that uh, uh, situation carefully in your design, whatever is possible to uh, take care of. And this is a similar thing uh, of a float plane. That was a previous one was the uh, float plane. This is a flying boat. And you can see when it lands, the lateral stability is very, very bad. And the, the floats which they are given are not enough uh, uh, well deployed. And that is something which uh, is not a bad, uh, it's not necessarily designed, but it could be an operational problem. All right, something, this is uh, having a bit of an audio. And this is just to show that uh, environmental concern is also a requirement. And then uh, you can't have noise, which is not acceptable. It's a very small plane, as you can see, the noise is so high. It is no better than, uh, better than any uh, conventional aircraft. But if it is in the midst of an urban uh, scenario, there will be a lot of disturbance, and I think that needs to be that needs to be assessed. You can see that you saw the uh, the Doppler effect. The frequency of uh, approach is so high as compared to the, free, the same machine giving a low, uh, showing a no, no, uh, low noise level. So this is something which, uh, as far as this is concerned. But let me let's get get back to uh, the type of. Um, uh, place that we are talking about. That is the uh, amphibian aircraft. Uh, and this is uh, something which most of you guys must have seen already. But this is something which uh, I thought I'll repeat. This is a typical firefighter. You can see it's working on the step. 
and then it is uh, maneuvering itself on water, and then it is taken off, and you can see the way the, uh, the, the water or the, um, or the uh, fire retardant is uh, distributed. And here is the, some details which you must be able to look at. Uh, all the uh, floating systems have a compressed air cabins air, um, to make it float. All right, so this is something which is there. And this is your scooping mechanism, just one of them. You don't have to ape, repeat what it is. You must select the best that you think can think of, and it should be different, more efficient than what people are using. And this is something which you, um, you must put your thoughts on. I'll skip this and then go to the last one, I think. Um, no, last bit one. And so here it is. This is a similar fly. There's a Canadian firefighting system. You can see it is preparing well ahead of the, uh, the fire zone, and it moves over the fire zone quite frequently and in um, uh, at a very low altitude. You can see it is not far away for, uh, in terms of height altitude from the fire zone, and it also needs uh, ground support for for doing efficient firefighting uh, sorties. So this is, so you can see there the catenary, I mean, the, the way the liquid is going to uh, disperse over the fire, fire zone. And this is something which you must think of uh, and see what are the things that can be uh, incorporated to make it more efficient. Uh, this is uh, again, uh, a built RC plane, flow, uh, flying boat for water uh, dro dropping and picking up water and dropping. It's been done. It can spin and you can see how efficiently it is um, uh, taking off um, and landing. This is, of course, a, a toy plane. I mean, a small de development plane to prove the concepts of uh, things. So there are possibilities, and you, know, you already have some examples of how how to design, how to run uh, flying boats or float planes to do whatever you wanted to do. But this is some uh, list, of small sets of uh, video clips I thought I'd mention. Uh, to coming to the summary, it's already six o'clock. Uh, we have done some clarifications on the requirements, which was uh, amended the last time. And I wanted to highlight the fact that it's not just uh, typical conventional aircraft design. It is also a lot of aerodynamics involved in the conceptualization. And that because it's always combined aerodynamics and hydrodynamics. And the hydro surfaces are very com as complex as aerodynamic surfaces and they are very important. And there are many subsystems which cannot be ignored. Uh, you need to, to be a part of the conceptualization. And the most important of them are the water scooping, dispensing mechanisms and landing gear. Um, so this is what I wanted to tell. And I just want to say, uh, you know what it is. Um, it's supposed to be uh, saying thank you. So that is, uh, so thanks. And I, I, you must pardon me for rushing uh, this through uh, because most of you are in the midst of the program. I'm sure most of you would, have be, would be aware of whatever I told, but I thought I'll just uh, push this um, thought through. Uh, basically to say, uh, hydrodynamics cannot be a small segment of your conceptualization study. It has to be equally important and especially when you are flying the aircraft in the air, while it's on water and roll, it's the hydrodynamic predominant. While it is on uh, in the air, it is aerodynamics alone, but you can see the configuration is totally different from a typical aircraft. The aircraft uh, landing gear gives you so much of drag, you're uh, forced, constrained, and you're forced to withdraw the landing gear and put it in the belly, where you can't do this, uh, with the hydrodynamic um, you know, with the amphibian aircraft. All the drag surfaces are still um, uh, there, and you need to therefore look at the aerodynamics of uh, amphibian totally differently. I mean, in more detail than necessary. So this is all I wanted to say. Thank you, thank you very much. Professor Pant, I've just finished, and I don't know if, I, uh, if, uh, if you want me to take any questions. I'll try to answer them, but I thought, um, um, the, the, the answer should come from the students who are doing the projects. I'm done with Professor. Thank you. Prada? Yes, sir. Thank you so much for the elaborate presentation. I'm sure the participants uh, 
were able to take a lot from this. And uh, I don't know if Professor Pant is online, but if any uh, parts, he is muted actually. Yes, so I think, sir, if you do have time, uh, we can take up some questions if that's okay with you, sir. Yeah, yeah, no issue. No, no worry. <laughs> Sure. So I will request uh, the participants to please uh, raise their hands and I will allow them to talk to and interact with uh, the speaker if they have any questions regarding the presentation. Please go ahead or you can put it in the Q&A section. I'll be more than happy to read it out to the speaker directly. All right, we have one raised hand. Yeah. Just a second. Yes, William, please uh, unmute yourself and you can speak. Uh, thank you, Pranav. Uh, good evening, sir, and thank you for your uh, talk. Yeah, William, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, so uh, my question was actually about the propulsion system. So you mentioned that it could be piston driven or turbo prop, but you left out um, uh, turbojet engines. Uh, uh, no, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, uh, all I said. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm complete your question. Uh, please go on, sir. Uh, no, all I said was I say engines are uh, okay for small aircraft, uh, maybe two, three seater, uh, four seater. Uh, and they're okay with IC engines, but today nobody is trying to use IC engines, especially when it's uh, uh, amphibian. And therefore, it is either turbo, uh, the turbo props. Most of them are turbo props, and there are also possibilities. And there are quite a few turbo, uh, pro, turbo, turbo, turbo fans and turbo jets are being used. So the today's choice for you, as um, as far as uh, firefighting amphibian is concerned, it is between turbo props and turbo jets. So which one will you use? Or what is the sizing of the, that engine is something which you need to do. I didn't uh, forget about turbo jet and turbo props. They are there. They are, the, in fact, uh, the staple um, for this uh, aircraft. Uh, yes, all right, sir. Thank you. Okay. Right, sir. There's one question, sir, that yes. how does the pilot deal with the torque during landing? Since the aircraft will experience a sudden torque when the floats touch the water. How does the pilot adapt for this sudden talk? I, I uh, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, Pranam, is that the question? Uh, yes. I, I, it is very similar to, it is very similar to uh, the pilot who handles a um, very severe crosswind uh, of a typical conventional aircraft. Uh, that is, um, he is uh, trying to touch down. He, he is trying to um, uh, steer the aircraft at an angle. Uh, to the runway direction, runway, middle of the middle line of the runway, um, because he knows there is a there is a, a crosswind. There, it is there is a very not very um, uh, good uh, feedback to him with reference to the crosswinds uh, that are available at the airport. So he's he is uh, having a basic configuration or a protocol to how to align the aircraft with reference to the wind direction and the wind velocity. And then he lands with a, a skew. And then once it touches down, he, he rides the aircraft to run in the direction. That is as far as the conventional aircraft is concerned. It is very similar here, but uh, you, you're right. You see the, the whole difficulty of the, uh, the seaplane or the amphibian is, uh, it is always impossible <coughs> to prevent uh, sideward loads because either it is wavy and therefore you, you, you don't have a symmetrical landing or you may be landing with a different uh, a roll position where one of the, um, one of the float planes uh, touches first and then you have a very unstable uh, uh, forces. So the, the, the pilot has not much time uh, to react. So he has to make sure that his landing is as straight as symmetrical as possible and not too much of side thrust is developed. And if it does, he has to, uh, his, his ability to respond to that with his rudders is something which uh, is a pilot skill. But beyond that, it, it is the ability of the float plate. For example, the location of the floats, if it is too close to the hull of the aircraft, 
and you have an asymmetrical thing, you have a problem of uncontrollable, uncontrollable um, uh, instabilities. Therefore, uh, you, as much as possible, you, got, you have to spread the location of the floats uh, with reference to Sentinel and the aircraft so that the unstable uh, loads or cyber loads due to uh, this, uh, the unequal landing is minimized. It can be prevented, but it can be minimized. There are a whole lot of story with reference to the design of the aircraft and the instantaneous skill, the response of the pilot to move, move, make sure that the system writes itself and lands properly, though it lands sluggishly, rather wrong uh, one, one float uh, landing first, uh, it, it gets itself uh, uh, corrected as soon as possible. So it's about both the pilot scale as well as the, the design of the location of the floats uh, with reference to the uh, wing and the size of the aircraft. So there are both issues. Right. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ambuj, I would request you to please unmute yourself and you can ask question to sir directly. I've given you permission to unmute yourself. If you could please go ahead and ask the question or otherwise I'll be happy to read out the question for you. All right. I think, uh, so, all right, sir, the question is any studies pertaining to the effect of drag of floats while they are airborne, any gross idea about the percentage rise, payload capability, power requirement estimation, structural reinforcement of the fuselage, gear advisory system for predicting height above water surface, glassy landing studies. Oh, well, well, well that's a, that's a, Pretty loaded question. I don't think I have uh, one word or one sentence or one, one uh, a short answer for a big question. It's a huge question. It's something like, I mean, if you understand what is the drag of a landing gear of a typical, say, 737 aircraft with the landing out, landing gear out and with the landing gear in, if you understand that uh, typical uh, case, you will understand this uh, landing, uh, the, the, the drag of the float, which you can't actually retract. It is always there for um, for eternity. So you need, and it depends on the aircraft um, uh, forward speed. When you say drag, we're talking about drag during takeoff, uh, when it is uh, rolling out, uh, when it's uh, we roll from the water. And then when you're doing, when you're doing uh, a cruise, for example, or when you're approaching the fire zone, you are not going to do a symmetrical flight. It's going to be a quite a bit of maneuver. So the drag uh, component of that is going to be very difficult to uh, empirically assess uh, in one, one short set of formulae. So you need to dwell on that. And there's a lot of, lot of uh, things that you have asked and I'm including uh, other uh, issues. So I think you need to go one by one and see if there are, um, if not, I mean, it's very difficult for you as students doing a conceptualization project um, to make a very detailed estimate of these things. Uh, and it needs a lot of, lot of work to do. And so therefore we need to spend a lot of time in understanding these things and how uh, at least uh, it can be met has to be stated as a part of the uh, project report. Right, sir. Okay. This was the question from Dr. Ambud Srivastava. He's from HAL. Yeah. All right. So uh, I think, sir, your question has been answered. Now I request any other students, if they have any question, please feel free to take this opportunity to interact. And uh, you can please raise your hands. And uh, Okay. Uh, uh, Pranav, I have a small suggestion. So yes, if sir. any student wants to ask a question, they just raise their hand and we will promote them as panelists. They can ask their questions verbally also. Right, sir. That's what I'm doing, sir. Wonderful. So do that. All right. So Just raise your hands, uh, whoever wants to ask a question, and we will promote you. Uh, Nishita has one question. I'll quickly allow you to talk so that you can interact with her directly. Yes, Nishita, please go ahead and ask your question. You can unmute yourself and talk. Uh, yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Nishita. Yes, sir. Uh, my question was that can uh, is scooping more like the conventional cruising of an or is it like taxing or is it a combination of both? 
and what else do we need to consider uh, in yeah. terms of comparing it with the conventional phases? You are talking about scooping, is it? Uh, yes, sir. Skimming over the water while uh, collecting yeah. the water. Uh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. No, the issue is um, typical aircraft. Um, I, I mean, I'm sure Dr. Pant will uh, say a lot of things on that. Uh, typical aircraft, uh, you have a de defined uh, um, start uh, from start to take off roll um, velocities. And then there's a different configuration, different defined uh, wind conditions, and so on. So it is well defined. Whereas here, uh, in addition to taking off uh, from water, where you you have the uh, thrust, which is much more than what is the water resistance while it is uh, skimming on surface from almost zero velocity to the takeoff velocity, and that is to be estimated. But on top of it, if you're going to scoop water, and at the rate of uh, say five tons of water within about a, a thousand meter, the scooping of water uh, is dependent on the forward speed of the aircraft on the surface and the area of intake, and also the resistance offered by the inner, inner surfaces for the water to enter. And so there's a lot of undefined uh, drag I mean, resistance. When you say drag, we're not talking about drag, conventional drag, but then the it has to flow through the water and while it's flowing through, it should allow water to enter because of this sheer velocity of the collecting surface. And therefore that needs to be estimated. And therefore the, the dynamics of water getting into, um, you're not talking about a pump. You're not talking about uh, sucking system. It is basically a, an end, um, an opening uh, below the surface, uh, below the surface of the amphibian, uh, which opens out and allows the water to go inside and get collected, and it should not return because of the for forward speed of the aircraft. Uh, water will not, once entered will not be enough, enough uh, energy to get out, and therefore it, it depends. Therefore, it, uh, the what the, the, the speed of the aircraft on the surface uh, and then the inlet area uh, and the amount of water that's collected, this offers a resistance. And on top of the resistance due to hydrodynamic um, uh, forces acting on the aircraft and the aerodynamic forces in the aircraft, you also have the scooping resistance. So this is uh, the crux of the whole thing. So you need to put in effort to understand uh, what sort of um, forces are going to uh, act as an additional, if you call it as drag, uh, additional drag. Yeah. I don't know whether I have answered your um, question, Ishita. Yes, sir, you answered the question. Thank you. All right. So any more questions from any participant? Please feel free. So I'm having one question can I ask. Uh, this is Prachi. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, Prachi, yes. Yes, sir. Thank you for such an informative talk, sir. Right. So actually, the hydrodynamic forces which you are talking about right now, so our yeah. aircraft, uh, uh, what we are given as a project, yeah. it will be mechanism, uh, scooping the water. That is the uh, main part with, where we are encountering right. the water. Right. So means... Uh, is there any calculations when any material available where we can go through exactly how we are going to calculate the hydrodynamic forces acting on the aircraft? I'm, I'm pretty certain. There are a few, and I'll try to, um, after this webinar, maybe tomorrow, I'll try to list down the references for these calculations. It may not be uh, in one place. So we need to scout around and I'll send across to you. Uh, you can perhaps... Um, uh, inform the students who are working on that. Okay, thank you. So, sir, there's one question from Dr. Prabhu, Dr. Shahar Prabhu, uh, right. from YouTube. Is a plain tail configuration preferred over a conventional tail? Uh, well, actually, uh, to answer that question indirectly, I have no ready answer, ready made answer for that. Um, Professor Prabhu, uh, the uh, what I showed you and what I know for sure is. The typical uh, land, uh, typical conventional aircraft, uh, transport aircraft, for example, configurations of 737 uh, or MD Magnolia Douglas uh, aircraft have been converted 
to act as uh, seaplanes. Uh, seaplane. I'm not talking about firefighting amphibian aircraft, but uh, seaplanes. So obviously the tailplanes of the existing aircraft are good enough to assist, uh, to help uh, the seaplanes to work on water as well as in the air as an amphibian. Um, so, um, so this is uh, to answer that question. Therefore, uh, the tail planes of uh, civil, I mean, conventional aircraft are uh, as good as what you can have, especially for seaplanes. Right, sir. Thank you so much for the answer. I think uh, there are no more questions from the YouTube platform. If there are any more questions from the attendees, you may please ask them. Raise your hands. And we we'll give an opportunity to interact with Dr. Anshani. So uh, one more. Uh, yeah. Yes, Prachi. Uh, sir, here in this, can we consider that the helicopters while dozing of the fire, the external connection of means that the system which yeah. scoops the water and doses of the fire. So yeah. is it all? Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, you can consider uh, bigger aircraft which can uh, scoop in. We have got helicopters, uh, big transport helicopters, uh, huge helicopters, no problem with that. But will any helicopter be cost effective? And will that be able to scoop uh, in 15 seconds five tons of water from the surface of water uh, is the question. Um, so if the, I mean, the, 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 it's an open question, it, uh, it is left to the imagination of anybody to configure the system. And as long as the helicopter uh, is able to handle, um, uh, pull in five tons of water or four and a half tons of uh, chemical and be able to move at 250 kilometers per hour to uh, maximum speed. And we're also saying, uh, the specification says you can perhaps return at 500 kilometers per hour I don't know if it falls within the regime of a typical helicopter uh, capabilities. So one has to see. Uh, it's not just the water uh, quantity. It is, but I, I know what you're saying is correct. It is the best option because you don't have to go at a very high speed uh, while dousing fire because then it is a tricky issue. Whereas if you've got an helicopter, it can over around at a con con uh, con comfortable, uh, uh, altitude, a height above the fire zone, and drop water directly down below. For example, while the, the typical firefighting scenario in urban uh, the, they, these days were helicopters which carry water and just dump it down, straight down. But then um, five tons of water and 250, we, we, you may want to do, uh, say, eight sorties, uh, three sorties, five sorties, we'll be able to do uh, we'll be able to do uh, five times the one question. Second question is, we are also talking about uh, a fire, fire over endurance uh, between refueling. How much of fuel will you carry in an helicopter apart from five tons of water? And there are other uh, uh, parameters which are clamping you uh, down to maybe option other than helicopter. Maybe uh, it's open question. You know, but we need to satisfy all these specification requirements of the of the. Uh, okay, so actually, my question was not about that using the helicopters. My question yeah. Bucket connection. That uh, yeah, uh, some means uh, to doors of the fire. Is there any yeah. mechanism? Uh, yeah, now we uh, have given a requirement of inbuilt mechanism of water scooping. Right, right. It should be there in the aircraft. So can yes. we consider an external connection like we are? We can management of the oh, aircraft. Yeah, and uh, absolutely. Now uh, uh, this uh, aircraft which are flying is a flying at say uh, 100 uh, kilometers per hour or 60 kilometers per hour uh, cannot uh, have a dangling. A suction system uh, in in water, and so they because they are moving. So the only option for that is helicopter. So helicopter is uh, above water surface; it's not on the water surface. But you have a connection to the water surface, but you should be able to scoop uh, five tons of water in fifteen seconds. So is that possible from helicopter powered? You would have power for pumping that sort of thing, sucking that sort of uh, volume and weight in 15 seconds. It's a, still an option as long as you're able to do that. 
Okay, so fine. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, there's uh, one question in the chat box from Ajit Chetri. I'll quickly allow him to unmute himself. Yes, Ajit, please ask your question to sir directly. You can unmute yourself and speak. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Ajit. Good evening. Uh, it was very nice, informative sir, in, uh, presentation. Th thank you for that one, sir. You're welcome. Sir, my question is, uh, uh, if when we are designing uh, some hall or uh, anything and going through the literature, we are getting some general thumb rules, kind of thumb rules. Right. Uh, but we are not able to find any resource where we, uh, which uh, which gives us some relationship between weight, speeds, or some general way of uh, dealing with those designing things. We are right. getting some general thumb rule, uh, right. like step should be some 10 degree from online joining those things and all. Right. But we are not getting some relations which gives us uh, a very a relation between like weight, gross weights, and speeds, and all these things. I can right. uh, can you please help us on those things? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'll try to do as much as possible. But when there is a, a department of ocean engineering and marine engineering in IIT Madras, and I think there are a couple of people, uh, faculty and professors in IIT Bombay as well. So perhaps you can talk to them and see if there is a, a reference available to help you out, uh, you guys, to understand these things in more detail and be confidently be able to uh, optimize things as you want. Uh, we will try to do that, uh, Jit. Yeah, I would like to also answer this a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, Ajit, uh, see, uh, this is a very specialized subject and uh, you may not get dedicated textbooks which talk about the nuances of design of amphibian aircraft. Because it is not something which has been done by a large number of people. So there are textbooks available for that. And uh, also remember that what you are supposed to do is basic conceptual design. And if you are able to quote the textbooks that you are referring to, and if you are able to use those thumb rules, that should be good enough, I think, for the current uh, current project. And don't try to don't try to like uh, go for a very detailed design of an aircraft because that, as Dr. Ramchand clearly mentioned, it's too complicated for a bunch of young students. So I'm not discouraging you, but I'm just saying that there is no point in unnecessarily trying to go into too much detail. You need to get a hang, and you need to get uh, information which is relevant to your aircraft. But there is no sales which is going to give you spoon feeding information. You'll have to look at textbooks which contain information. So one hint I can give to everybody is that there is a small case study in aircraft design given by Jenkinson and Marchman's textbook, which is really available online. It's called as aircraft design projects. Similarly, there are some books uh, which talk about sizing of a small amphibian aircraft. You just have to follow them and do your work. Uh, uh, Professor Pant, uh, I also want to add to what he said. Uh, if you see the video clips, there are at least two or three uh, groups of people who have built amphibians, I mean, for these float planes. They have designed, they have built, and they have flown. I'm sure they must have looked at the details of what you're looking at. Uh, one team itself is in uh, in industry of science. If you can get hold of those uh, people, and they are basically uh, working in the aerospace department, I'm sure they will be able to guide you through in that aspect. Thank you. Oh, sir, what we will do is we will request Dr. Omkar to take one of the webinars. Right. Because he has actually uh, led a team of students. But unfortunately, he's not taking part in the competition because his team did not have students. They were all yes. project engineers, so we had to disqualify that team. Right. So he is available as an expert, and we will approach him for uh, conducting a webinar like this, where he can maybe answer some more specific questions. Right. So we need suggestions. So, okay, uh, are there any more questions? Because I want to launch a small poll for all of you before you go, and we want to wind up at 6.30, because we began exactly at 5.00. So if there are any more questions, this is the right time to ask your questions. Otherwise, I'm going to launch a small poll and give you some time to, you know, uh, appear in that poll.
Okay, are there any more questions? Uh, Professor Pant, uh, this is uh, Srinivas. Yes. And uh, I really appreciate uh, Dr. Ramchandra for his uh, detailed presentation, touching all aspects of it. And some of the video clippings are really uh, connects the point what he was explaining. Maybe those uh, experiments which uh, the designers did and failures happened of uh, drowning the aircraft and imbalance and other things. Maybe that is a very important link which he is trying to provide. But I was reading some literature there. I also came across one aircraft which is uh, Japanese, yeah, Russian made BE 200 uh, ES, which is a very powerful aircraft, which is amphibian uh, with uh, 12 tons of capacity, which is recently being used for uh, Turkey firefighting operations. Maybe students can get some specs from that. That may also open up some thoughts about the features that are being built in this latest aircraft. Yeah, that's a very good idea. So we would request you if you can just uh, share with us some details or at least the name of this project and then the students can uh, probably just uh, locate the information from there. Yeah, I'll, I'll put a message to you. Great, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. Any other student or any participant in the um, webinar would like to ask something? Okay, so uh, we have just two minutes remaining in which I'm going to now launch a poll. Okay, all of you have a poll. Right, so please answer. There are five questions of which most are single choice types, but there is one which is multiple choice type. So please answer the questions. We will open the poll for some time. Pranav, is the poll visible to you? Yes, sir. The poll is visible. I got Very the questions. Good. Very good. Okay. okay so 10% of the people are now people are answering. 20% of people have already answered. Others may please answer quickly. Very good. We are almost reaching 86%, 85%. Just a few people remaining, precisely five people remaining. So even the people who are in the panels uh, should answer these questions, please. There is a line coming that host and panelists cannot vote. Okay, okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe that is the case. Yeah, because we will probably bias the answers. Yeah. There was a suggestion from Nishita through email that she wants a webinar. Their team wants a webinar on scoping mechanism. Yes, I don't know, but how to do a webinar on scoping mechanism? I really don't know. Uh, because the information that we have about the scooping mechanism is very limited and exactly what uh, Dr. Ramjan show those kind of videos are available. Okay, so more than that, I really don't have, but yes, we will try to search about it. But see, that is the only thing in this competition, which is something new and which is slightly beyond the normal. So I, I would expect students to really work hard and try to see what they can do. But yes, we will try to find someone who can talk about that. So there are four people who have not answered the poll. We don't want to wait too long because we already crossed 8.30. So within about one minute, I'm going to end the poll. So all the remaining people, if they're answering, they should answer within the next half a minute, after which we will close the poll.
Okay, so with that, I'm going to stop the poll now. Thirty. Okay, maybe there are just two people remaining, so we can probably just wait. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll now. And uh, the results of the poll are, have been shared with everybody. Prachi, please confirm that you are able to see the results. Yes, sir. Really with it. Yeah. So, would you like to just uh, read out the main results, Prachi? Yes, sir. The first question was, was this webinar useful? So, 97% is yes. Okay. Next. Question. Somewhat is uh, like 3% have yes, said that somewhat. Second question was, would you like to attend more such webinars? So 97% is again yes, and 3% is no. I don't know why. <laughs> and third question is, is the webinar timing suitable for you? 70% yes, it's okay with me. 23% no, it should be only on weekends. And 13% said they should be held in the morning. Sorry. And... 30% are like, uh, they should be held during evenings after 5 p.m. Fourth question was, would you like to suggest topics for the next webinar? 53% are no, the organizers may decide. And 47% is yes, I would like to suggest. Okay, so those... And are, so one more question is there. Yes, yes. Yeah. Fifth question is, are you enjoying participating in Nantec 5? 97% yes, and 3% is no. Okay. All right. So thank you so much for your honest feedback. And uh, great, so no problem. And uh, we will now uh, stop the webinar and uh, we would, uh, you know that the recording of this webinar will be available on the channel, okay? So uh, what we can do is for a photograph, we can just switch on to the gallery and all of us, if possible, should uh, put your uh, camera. So, but we can't allow that, right? Only the panelists can, Probably right, sir. Uh, Only the okay. panelists can share it. All right. So let all the panelists at least do it. So we can then take a picture. And uh, that's only for our records. Okay. Right. Uh, Ajit can be uh, sent back. Yeah. Yes. Just a second. So I'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. Done. Okay. So I'll take a picture so that we can save it. Thank you so much. And we look forward to more such webinars. Dr. Shinovas, thank you so much for joining us. And we hope to also see you in the future webinars. We normally have one every month by some eminent speakers. Okay. And Dr. Ramchand, as always, thank you so much for being so kind to talk to the students about the amphibian aircraft design principles and challenges. And um, we will now look for some other uh, speaker for the next yes. webinar based thank on the course. suggestions of the students. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Course. Thank you. So thank you everyone. I'll be closing this webinar now. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramchand. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Yeah, thank you. Close this.